Hello, this is Greg Smalley on Pod 366, a Weird Movies podcast. Later in this episode, we will be joined by Christiane Sadavsky of Blood Tea and Red String as our special guest. Uh, our Another correspondent, Brian Pike, will join us from down under to help out on that interview. For this first segment, I am joined, as I often am, by Giles Edwards to discuss today's or this week's new releases. And then we will take a break and get uh, Christiane on. Giles, how are you? Oh, I, I'm great. I, I have my cat right here because uh, I'm in my in the kitchen in the hopes of uh, having a stable connection and having just dealt with uh, some home repair stuff. So I'm all all zazzed up. <laughs> Did uh, your uh, Halloween go well? Uh, yes, I actually got uh, a few trick-or-treaters this year, which is a few more than I have for the past three or four years. So I guess there there are young people in the area. Again, and if you see a cat walk across the screen, I'm sure you can go. We can go, yes. Well, uh, I didn't have uh, any trick-or-treaters myself, and nor did my parents. I think they had one. That was pre-planned. But I did watch Renfield, which is oh, yeah. not a weird movie. Uh, entertaining. Mm -hmm. I think, I, you know, without Nick Cage as Dracula, uh, it would be far less entertaining. But uh, it was diverting, passable. A lot of uh, action, comedy, horror. More action than I expected, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and indeed, a lot of bloody heads blowing up and things like that um oh, okay yeah i wouldn't have expected that either but i see well yeah i don't yeah not strictly recommended for weird movie fans in particular uh nick cage fans uh, you know will want to watch anything he's in so they will watch it but we're going to talk about five different movies and some movies not coming to a theater near you. We'll start out with this one that will not be at a theater near you. Um, you want to describe the still, Giles? I will do my best. Yeah. Uh, it's very dark. Looks like uh, out of frame, there's got to be a spotlight pointed, spotlight pointed down, maybe around a 45 degree angle onto a stage, onto a woman seated on what looks like a toilet, but surrounded by stage and darkness, woman uh, slightly longer than shoulder length, uh, strawberry blonde curlyish hair, and wearing uh, uh, like a little pink nighty thing. Yeah. So um, couldn't, couldn't really guess what may have been going on before or what will be going on after this moment. Ah, do you know the movie it's from? No. Oh wow! This is this is a still from Open, uh, the new wave musical, as far as I can tell, uh, independent feature. As I say, it's in theaters somewhere, probably not near you, though you can look for it. As I understand from the trailer, it's going to be, a, and it's hard to see how they're going to get these two ideas together. But I guess that's the magic of movies. A movie about a couple that agrees to uh, an open relationship and they're going to start dating other people. And the woman has hallucinations that she's in an 80s new wave band. Okay, yeah. Did you see the trailer, Giles? Uh, gosh, I, I think I might have, because we, we've talked about open before. Talked about it before, yeah. Uh, so... I, I probably have that said, I will be going into this blind. Apparently, I'll be going into this blind very soon to write for next week. So I'm excited. Okay. Well, it is, yes. Um, you know, it's it's an indie uh, feature. There will be almost no faces you recognize, although there's a Miles Doliak, I believe, is in it. And he's a character actor who you may have seen uh, before and you may recognize him when you see him without 
quite being able to place him. He's one of those guys. We call oh, yeah. him like all those guys, which is meant as a, a compliment. It just means you've been in a lot of movies and uh, people know your face. Yeah. It's, uh, well, as, uh, as I've heard uh, them described in Bojack Horseman, uh, toiling in lucrative obscurity. <laughs> yes, character actors are the unsung heroes of the acting industry. Uh, the low featured players, uh, but above extras. Um, so yeah, the trailer, you know, it's uh, it's got that, uh, it's mostly got that uh, 80s feel to it in those hallucination sequences, I guess, um, which is probably, you know, the uh, impetus for creating it. There's probably a fan of, of that era. And there's some of those, uh, you know, uh, cheap knockoff industrial light and magic type effects with uh, squiggles and line, lights, laser beam type stuff going across the screen, yeah. pink yeah. colors and stuff like that. Um, so we don't have much to say about that. We'll have more to say next right. week. I'm gonna match that with a review of another musical, uh, which I went out and saw last night and determined merited some coverage, which is uh, Dick's the musical. Oh. Again, not so much a weird movie, although certainly weirder than Renfield, and it has at least one scene that's probably going to make our weirdest movies of the year, uh, our weirdest scenes of the year, but mm. it's probably more of just a, you know, obscene, gay, gross-out movie <laughs> than a weird movie per se. Uh, from the guy who directed Borat, Larry Charles, so you know, okay. he's not going to shy away from uh, uh, much of anything, I imagine. Gross out humor, yes. There's there's some some gross out humor in it, and uh, a lot of uh, in your face transgressiveness. Uh, but that's yeah. uh, that's Dick's the musical, and uh, this we're looking at. So we open the musical. Open the musical. Oh, so it's a musical week. Musicals week next week. We're doing a themed week. Um, let's move on, however, to the next movie that you won't be able to see in theaters unless you live in New York City uh, and uh, want to go out to Nighthawk Theater in Brooklyn to catch this. Uh, I believe it's debuting on Thursday, which is why we're mentioning it today instead of waiting another week. So a week. Uh -huh from when we're recording this. Uh, you want to describe what we're looking at, Giles? And We are looking at a younger side of middle-aged Jeremy Irons gazing kind of blandly, forlornly, just over the observer's shoulder, neck up, vague background of office maybe, black and white, just above a sepia-toned picture of I don't know who that is, but there is in handwriting the title Mr. Neff. And of course, as anyone who has been following this project for the past decades uh, will know that, lo and behold, Soderbergh has done something with a movie he made years and years ago. Yeah, it's the, uh, yeah, the, it's described as Mr. Neff. The title's right there. And it's a silent film with sound and music. Oh, yes, yes. So I guess that means di dialogue free, uh, but they're going to allow the uh, natural sound effects to come through, I assume. And uh, so, um, Giles, why don't you, I, I doing my uh, research for this, I remembered or discovered that you had reviewed Kafka, the movie that Mr. Neff is uh, a new version of yeah. uh, for our site originally. Can you tell the watcher and listener something about Kafka? And then we'll- uh, Kafka is uh, sort of, hmm, biopic feel, sort of, well, it's, it's hard to say. It's about Kafka. Jeremy Iron stars as Kafka. Um, and it takes place in a sort of drab, mid-industrial era city with 
Kafka, the character, I don't remember if he's ever named one way or... Yeah, he's named Franz Kafka. So it's about Franz Kafka and concerns uh, him being a writer, but there's also weird little uh, revolutionary-esque things going on in the background that he gets tied up in. And it's black and white, except for one special stretch uh, just before the sort of epilogue or coda to the thing where... Uh, the action comes to a head in a grander, creepier, slightly more bombastic way than the preceding uh, bit of movie. It was received mixedly, I believe is the uh, most diplomatic way to phrase that. And uh, from my understanding, uh, there were things that Soderbergh wanted to do with it that for various reasons he couldn't at the time and for years has threatened to do things to this. And it seems he's finally bitten the bullet and decided to do this with it by stripping it of its uh, dialogue or at least, you know, uh, audio dialogue. And I'll be interested to see while listening to Sound and Music just how he pulls off that hat trick because one of the main draws for me in a Jeremy Irons movie is a Jeremy Irons voice because he's got one of those great uh, voices uh, in my opinion and so just to see him uh, without it well, that'd be interesting too so yeah okay. what I remember I saw Kafka when it first came out and haven't seen it since so you've seen it much more recently than I do what stuck in my mind was the color image of the giant eyeball like peel, peering through oh um, yeah yeah that uh, yeah the giant uh, the 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 megascope scene yeah. i guess is uh, what might be might describe that uh, implement um so this one is 20 minutes shorter and apparently 20 minutes have been stripped from the end so they might have taken out the color sequence and that sequence i re most remember <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, um, he recut this and debuted it at the Toronto Film Festival in 2021 and then nothing. And now it's playing again, as far as we know, for one night only at the Nighthawk Theater in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, I do know that he has people are uh, Metallica fans seem excited that there is a scene of um or a scene that's accompanied by an instrumental version of inter sandman so uh that has been a tidbit that has been dropped from folks who've seen it so apparently that scene was uh memorable to people although they may might just know the song and but anyway people mention it uh we don't know really very much else about it the only people who've seen it are the people who saw it in toronto and then these people who will see it in New York. However, there are persistent rumors that it will be released on home video. Mm. One of the rumors has it being released in a box set with other movies that Soderbergh has recut, including Schizopolis, which is one of our canonically weird movies. Mm. And so if that happens, uh, that will be pretty huge item uh, for us to cover and for people who are interested in weird movies to buy. So yes, this is a big, uh, this is kind of a big release or big, big news in a way, although no one will be, a, almost no one will be able to see it for a while, but there is at least the hope that we can see Kafka and see if Sorderberg has managed to sort of redeem what was kind of a forgettable movie despite the really cool premise yeah uh, uh, yeah glancing over my review because uh as you said i did this yeah about a year and a half ago now and um it was the second time i'd ever seen it uh, first time i saw it was kind of it was newish on vhs rental and uh yeah it's uh there's a lot there's it's a movie I'd recommend if I remembered so to do. 
I guess, because it, it does have enough interesting things going on and, you know, it was never boring and the topics, you know, good. And it's, uh, it does have a fan base and I, I think deservedly so, but um, yeah, a rejigging uh, hopefully is uh, going to serve it well. I can see how it might work as a silent, but uh, we'll, we hopefully we'll get a chance to judge for ourselves relatively soon. Moving on. Um, now, this is a movie we don't know much about. Do you want to describe at least the poster for people? Sure. Yeah, this is done sort of like street graffiti style. Top third of it is uh, is a drawing of a woman's head, kind of that, that dome haircut, you know, resting around the shoulders thing. Uh, not too precise a, uh, a rendering, but very clearly a, a woman. And also equally clearly is a giant centipede looking thing that starts becoming photorealistic the further it goes from her open face. Going down uh, the middle third of the poster in question with one of its, I'm gonna guess, I don't know, some sort of antenna or other tendril-esque thing coming from this uh, many-legged bug kind of wrapping around and embracing the title Fugue, which is done in a sort of know, maybe blotchy lipstick kind of font there. Yeah, this is the film. This is from the, excuse me, director who made The, the Lure, the Killer Mermaid musical movie that is canonically weird. This was her follow up, and it kind of didn't get when it was originally released in, I believe, 2018, kind of didn't get the uh, any any real notice. I don't think it even got a an actual uh, home video release until now. Um, didn't play many theaters over here, at least. Her name is I don't know how to pronounce it. It's it's Smugnis guys. I'll say the lure. <laughs> um, <laughs> This, she's the woman who directed The Lure, which was, you know, fantastic and was picked up by the Criterion Collection, no less. Uh, this one seems to be more of a quiet sort of psychological thriller about a woman with amnesia or, as the title might suggest, in a fugue state. Mm. And, uh, we really don't know, I don't know much more about it than that. The trailer didn't reveal very much sort of atmospheric uh, Giles, do you know or can you add anything? Uh, I can confirm what you say. It uh, definitely suggested atmospheric um, without the uh, included summary from Video Universe. I might have been hard pressed to guess even the vague contours that you just went over. Uh, but what really made me wonder, and it's probably nothing more than a technical weirdness, is uh, after the, the trailer proper lasts a minute and 45 seconds, and then after that there's 48 seconds of sort of like a TV blank color bar with uh, some light music in the background, which I, I imagine signifies nothing, but it was kind of interesting to see it fall into that uh, like holding broadcast panel. All right. Well, what, what I think that was is... Uh... Uh, that wasn't an official trailer release. I think that uh -huh. was added on by uh, the people who were hosting it on their YouTube channel as their own branding and to increase the length of the video for whatever reason. I think I guess I think it's going to help them with the with the with the uh, the uh, uh, I don't know. I'm blanking. I don't know. Help uh, help with the algorithms that you uh, uh, okay. I I think. That sometimes. I don't know, but that was not part of uh, the well, as I said, I didn't think it was really part of that. I just uh, thought it it was strange. strange. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the movie looks strange and atmospheric. Yeah, and it's on Blu-ray now, and it was picked up for some reason by the catalog, who normally does uh only much older releases. This is the newest release they've done, but they do specialize in Eastern European stuff. Mm -hmm. So they have Eastern European connections. And so they were able to get a hold of this one. And it should be interesting. We hope that it is just an overlooked sort of classic, uh, but we don't know. Uh, on next, this is something that had just popped up in my feed this week and I added it 
Uh, why don't you describe it, Giles? Yeah. Okay. Uh, here, let me let me brighten my screen a little bit. See if I. Oh, no. okay. There we go. All right. So, all right. Two men in the woods. One back to the camera, far left screen. The other near, close to mid distance, up against a tree. And projecting from that other who is facing us and the gentleman to the left, our left, a dramatic expression and a beam of bright green light extending from his forehead and drawing a neat little outline to what I presume is the victim that is standing in the foreground facing away from us. Yeah, going back to the industrial light and magic ripoff effects of the uh, mid eighties. Well, so this is Ghost Nursing, a movie that just popped up out of nowhere. It's a Hong Kong release from kind of, I think it falls kind of into the um, the sort of no man's land between the end of the, you know, the great Kung Fu period and before what we would call the Hong Kong uh, New Wave, which starts yeah. in the late 80s. It's a yeah. period where they were kind of goosing up the uh, Hong, the uh, martial arts formula with all sorts of supernatural stuff to try to get more more life out of it, you know? Yeah, I got, I got uh, a nice list of uh, elements here. Yeah, the film is 1982 and uh, from the Vinegar Syndrome page, of course, this is from those fine people, has things like women in supernatural distress, rampaging ghosts, mystical black magic rituals, bodily possession, Taoist sorcerer monks, a botched exorcism, and of course, Plentiful graphic and gruesome horror, replete with squirming bugs, scalp mutilation, and gushing bodily fluids. And triads, too. Triads. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, probably yeah, talk about uh, And Kung Fu, I'm guessing, because the guy looks like a, a monk. So, And yeah, I, yeah. There, there's got to be some Kung Fu in it, because no Hong Kong movie of the period would be caught dead without a Kung Fu scene. Even if it's a you know romantic comedy, there'll be some guys fighting in it um yeah so it comes out from uh vinegar syndrome with no advance warning just sort of popped up on the radar can only be bought from them at the present time uh trailer uh is kind of wild um it should be one of those action-packed b movies of the period uh, that does not disappoint in delivering those exploitation tropes that fans of this kind of stuff love. And I count myself as a fan of this kind of stuff. Well, well, Greg, you better hop on it. They only have, they're only gonna release 6,000 units of this um, disc. Yeah. And it's not, uh, and it's not 4K, so 4K, so yeah, within your tech range. Yes, within it's it's yes, it's something I could get a hold of. And uh, so, speaking of uh, B movies that aren't 4K and are kind of uh, goofy, uh, mm -hmm. the Brainiac on uh, Blu-ray, not 4K, not a 4K upgrade, although they do advise that it's restored. Giles, do you want to see if you can describe it all the... <laughs> yeah, let me just, uh, just uh, try to take this. Okay, so this uh, we're looking at a Blu-ray case cover. Uh, upper sort of banner is a list of all the many famous and wonderful actors involved in the production. And I'll start with, I guess, the left-hand edge. We see a torso... We see a hand, we, it's, a, it's a hand with two sort of thumb-like things with suckers on the end going a little further down the left-hand side. We see a woman, uh, a prominently chested one in very obvious distress as a red uh, tendril thing pokes at her neck. Below her, another woman who looks more apprehensive than full-blown distress wearing a rather smart green, oh, well, probably ultimately a dress. And below her, is a third, I'm gonna guess it's actually a woman, although considering the uh, graphic chosen here, that looks like a seriously misplaced wig. 
despite the fact that it's a, a painted image. And now dominating the screen or the, uh, the cover here and what is doubtless the cause of the distress of this lineup of three women is, hmm. A brainiac. It's sort of humanoid, ape-esque, uh, trapezoidal, head-shaped, large fanged, long red tongued entity who I believe is the uh, controller owner of the the mandibles with the sort of two sucker thumbs. And I'm gonna guess, despite having only seen the trailer and not the movie itself, that this uh, monstrous humanoid is the titular Brainiac. And indeed it is. And that uh, uh, usually the uh, you know picture on the cover will be uh, stranger and uh, more vivid than the actual monster they deliver in the movie. In this case, it probably wasn't. The actual monster in the movie looks much stranger. That That is, you know, what it looks like, yes. But it's, in the movie, it's kind of like it's made out of paper mache. And there are just protrusions everywhere on this. I think I, how did I describe it? I described it as, um, in my original review, uh, the whole package seems to have been shipped to us equally from the land of parody and the land of nightmare. Um, and that, let's see, head is oversized, hairier than Dr. Hyde, temples and cheeks bulge and pulse when it sees itself faced with a helpless female victim. It's got a beak-like nose, shark protruding ears, dual fangs, lobster claw hands, and a two-foot tongue, a head hung with more phallic symbols per square inch than any other Mexican monster of its era. So it is truly a bizarre monster. Um, however, nothing else about the movie other than the monster is any good at all. So it is really just you're waiting for the monster to come on screen to look at it and say, how the hell did they come up with this <laughs> ridiculous yet horrifying looking thing? The movie is totally boring. Other than that, you know, typical mad scientists cross with the cult stuff coming back from the day. Who cares? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm curious. I mean, I, I haven't seen it. Uh, it, it seems the original name is El Baron del Terror. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, if, if you knew anything, why they called it Brainiac for the English language release. Well, it was uh, one of those movies that was picked up. I think he sucks brains, but... Uh, okay, that'll do it. It's a movie picked up by K. Gordon Murray, who released, picked up and released a number of Mexican cheapies and always uh, retitle them and run um, some ad campaigns to make them seem much more exciting than they actually were. And I think the Brainiac is a snappier title than the Baron of Terror. Yes. Um, and the guy in it is a Baron, but yeah, Brainiac's, Brainiac's snappier. K. Gordon Murray, Murray, of course, famously, most famously, uh, brought back the Mexican version of Santa Claus, which is one of our 366 Weird Movies official ones. And so that does it for this week's releases. In just a few minutes, on uh, no time at all for you, we are going to be joined by Christiane Zagavsky. And uh, Giles will not be here for that, unfortunately for him. Uh, he has some repairmen to deal with, I hope, <laughs> or expect. Um, but uh, if if uh, Christiane was here, would you have any questions for her that I can ask her, Giles, for you? Other oh, than the home um, You're not prepared. Okay. I'm not prepared, but but I, I can. I mean, obviously, there's the one question, but I was sure you, you'd be asking that uh, anyway. But uh, if you could uh, pass along my heartfelt thanks for such a, a wonderful film, which I had, I think I watched it for the big book review. So I think uh, so uh, very, very pleased with that experience. So I'm sure you and Nick will have a good deal of fun there. 
Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, we will sign off of this segment. Be back in just a second with Christiane and uh, see you then. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Hello, and we're back with our guest, Christian Savaski. And uh, also to my left on my screen is uh, Brian Pike, who is joining us from down under to ask some questions. And uh, frankly, I'll probably let uh, Brian uh, do most of the talking. Um, Christian, for most of you, is going to be familiar from Blood Tea and Red String, which is one of our 366 canonical weird movies. And uh, it's really a thrill to be able to have her here today after she's finished uh, teaching a course on animation um, in, earlier today. Um, to start off, I guess, I think uh, probably most people, if they're tuning into this, have seen Blood Tea and Red String. If they haven't, though, how would you describe it to a new viewer? Um, it is uh, considered by some a surrealist fable uh, created for adults. Generally, I, I aimed it at an adult audience with it being safe for most children. Um, and it's always better when other people describe it. It, it is. A, it's <laughs> I'm too close to the subject and I don't have my, I don't have my, my one liner, uh, um, but uh, I could, I could read it. Oh, hmm? Let's go around and I'll, I'll, I'll give my you know, how I would pitch it and Brian can do what he would do. I, it's a stop motion, first of all, uh, very sort of tactile with a lot of dolls, doll characters in it. And it's it's a fairy tale. And it is, I would say, it's uh, definitely got a surrealist take and it's dark and it's about uh, little forest creatures in some sort of imaginary forest. And uh, there, there are basically two bands. There are uh, mice who are sort of the villains of the piece and these creatures uh, called dwellers under the tree and the dwellers under the tree make a doll and give it to the mice as a present but the mice keep it and do some nasty things to it. <laughs> making it sound a little... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and there is also a um a little birthed creature from the doll um, I think a, a, a substitute possibly for yourself, Christian. Um, in some ways, yeah, it's de definitely it's definitely not autobiographical, um, but there's definitely autobiographical elements, deeply, deeply steeped in symbolism and diversion. <laughs> well, another thing. Um... So in, in very early comments that you've made uh, years ago uh, on the DVD commentary, I think you discussed sort of these characters had been developed uh, for many years before you put them on film through your artwork. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I, mean, I started out as a painting major and originally was not aiming towards animation and didn't really occur to me that I could be making art animation um, until seeing Jan Svankmeyer's Alice, which was uh, changed everything. I mean, I was 19 at the time and highly impressionable, very excited by, by his work. Um, so yeah, I the influence of um, Alice on your work is obviously quite significant. Um, you know, the use of stop motion, also the similar tone that you strike in your films it is very similar to um, Shank Meyer's uh, films. Yeah, and it just uh, brought into my own experience with brighter, brighter meadows and dry Northern California style grass and just bring, bringing it into the kind of the world that I know. And so um, I, I, this may be a little, uh, well, first, let's do, let's do a technical. Let's start with the technical questions because um, if I'm not if I'm not wrong, you did almost all the animation by yourself by hand. Is that correct? 
every frame. Completely. <laughs> 13 what? years of investment, yeah? Well, if you put it in a, in a little con context is, uh, it didn't really have a budget. So a lot of that 13 years was me working at my day job, just like waiting to get that little, those little chunks of free time to work on the film. The actual animation part, like once most of it was built, was um, more like, uh, was it four or five, four years probably total. In one year, in one year, I managed to animate. I started probably 30 minutes worth of it in a year. So it's got a lot of stops and starts and starting when I when I had it like um, almost done, I started working in the animation industry in Los Angeles and that was exciting and incredibly time consuming. So I learned a lot and so things went even more slowly there, but then I met a lot of people that could kind of help me, that, that helped me get get it to the finish line with the post-production elements that I, you know, I wasn't as experienced with. What were some of the animation companies that you worked at during that time? Um, most of my time was spent with Space Fast Films and we worked on things for Mad TV, Oxygen Network, um, we did the opening sequence for Even Stevens. I don't know if you know Disney Channel, Even Stevens. I don't know if this is the, this all this all a while ago. <laughs> um, a couple of commercials. Things like that. I worked mostly for them. I did a couple of projects with Acme Filmworks, the commercials that they were doing. And I worked for Benton Minch Lab in Portland for a little while on just, just free on a freelance basis. Not, Fabrication. But through that, you're able to support yourself and also support the making of the film, yeah? Yeah, that, that and the credit card. <laughs> so we're so a little bit like Crispin Glover, you know, putting his own money from his films into his work in that regard. Yeah, I think yeah, he has greater he has, he has greater funds to supply to yeah. his work. But, but yes, yes, so just, you know, trying to live live as frugally as possible and get this off the ground. The, the challenging part is that it was on 60 millimeter film and so processing costs are greater. It is, um, in my new work, I'm working in, uh, I'm working in a DSLR, digital filming, um, photographic with Dragon Frame. If anybody knows mm -hmm. what Dragon Frame is, it, it it's ta so it's taking a, a digital image from a DSLR camera. So it's as close to filming it as possible. And I don't try to mess with things CG or any of those hmm. also <laughs> the the resolution of the DSLR is significantly better than um, film right you're working I think with 8k now is that, is that correct I'm working in and it's actually um uh, ultra high def 4k so it's just a little it's oh. it's a 16 9 aspect ratio but it's considered the other 4k um yeah you don't want to think the wider you get the more set you have to make uh, <laughs> definitely like it's created a difference where like blood tea and red string feels how do you describe it it feels like the, the world i think feels kind of expansive but there, there's this sort of contained nature of like little tableau kind of nature to it where seed in the sand my new work that is in progress it's more cinematic like there's the the environments having that extra space and then just the environments it it just has a it just has a different feel to it and i don't think it's necessarily related to what medium i'm using to create it but it maybe it maybe it has it has has some some impact so there's a little set going on there it definitely sounds like a larger scope than um blood tea and red string yeah definitely i would and you, you, go ahead I, I I would uh, say if you were looking for a word to describe it, it's kind of diorama like, sort yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. Those dioramas that have like convinced more con the more convincing paintings, like the Natural History Museum type of dioramas, big with a good painting in the background. <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense than the word tableau. I totally agree. And with blood tea and red string, you're actually working blind, weren't you? Like you didn't actually have like a monitor to check from frame to frame. You essentially just um, 
putting each frame in place on the film gauge without really knowing um, how smooth or how. Why, yeah, yes. I mean, <laughs> there's two minutes of the film that I shot with a, with a video camera side by side, which was, a, it's not the last two minutes chronologically in the narrative, but the last two minutes that I, that I shot, I was, was like, after I thought I was done with it, then there were a couple of years went through while I was like trying to get the sound done. And then, I'm, then I realized it needed a new beginning and a new end and some new ending. Cause I kept getting new beginnings that <laughs> started starting at different places. So the original beginning was the putting of the egg in the doll. And then, uh, how many years later, uh, like three years later, I guess. Then the new beginning was the creek, you know, when they find the egg. And then I was like, no, that is not enough of a, it's not enough of a beginning. Um, and uh, well, well, that was in the last, that was the, the, the final animated beginning. No, wait. And then, then, and we, then I had to, then the third big, sorry, I'm getting all like tangled up. Then the, then the third beginning was um, the, the mice coming to request the making of the doll. So as I became a more, um, more sophisticated in storytelling, you know, I started to realize certain, I won't say deficits, but certain things where I was like, oh, I want to do that a little differently. And then, then finally, then the live action beginning was added because I'm like, what do I, what I put this into play? I can't, I, I don't know if I can really verbalize why the live action beginning became necessary. It just, a lot of the way I work is I, I think it's going to come to me and I'm like, oh yeah, I need to do that. And I don't, I don't over edit myself. I, I, I like, okay, that's what I need to do. And I just trust my instinct and my, and my inspiration. Um, Cause the moment you start to distrust your inspiration, your work becomes more watered down and uh, I know you're trying to please someone else. I don't know, but like, I, I just trust it and, it and it tends to, it tends to make my, uh, my narratives more challenge challenging for people to understand sometimes <laughs> but uh, I think it's a challenge that's worthwhile um so yeah I forgot where where we were going with this is the meaning deeply personal to you how, how much of it is um you know connected to emotions feelings things that are specific like personal to you versus more like archetypal storytelling I, I missed the very first word you said. It, it sounded like naming. Is the, is the what this? Uh, how how much of your work is personal oh, to you? All of it. Um, yeah. All of it is. I I mean I, I do. I have always done a lot of research into various things. Like, you know, I've, I've had my uh, Joseph Campbell times of being really obsessed with, with that and, um, fascinating trails through historical things and fairy tales it's like I'm, I'm fill I'm, I fill myself up with those sorts of influences but I don't say I don't decide oh I'm going to use these influences and that it's it all when I get ready to make my own work it's based on what comes to me so maybe I'm drawing maybe I'm just thinking maybe I'm on a road trip all of a sudden ideas just come to me um like I just made some major revisions in Seed in the Sand, and they, they, I have I have two co-producers now who are, are been a wonderful addition to. I just just because I have worked alone doesn't mean I always want to work alone. So I I'm still doing the animation all by myself right now, but they they brought this sort of energy of um, you could call it accountability perhaps, where where they 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 I had a the discussion started like well you you say that this is what you're going for right and. And and then you have this, this, and this, and we're not, not, you're not communicating what you're saying you want to communicate. At no point, that's why they're such great collaborators, at no point do they say, oh, well, and, and you should do this to fix it. They're just like, we don't really see what you, what it is that, you, that you're saying that it's there. So, and they kind of leave it at that. And then first I'm just like, oh, but don't you, you can't, can you not see it? And then I let it percolate in my head and, and, and then I get, it feels almost like a physical, like, impact when I get that idea I'm just like oh they're totally right and I, and, and I have the and I know exactly how to fix it and I fix it so that's that's the kind of so then in turn when I when I'm like trying to 
help other people or, you know, give other people feedback. I try to remember that feeling, you know, where I never tell people what they're supposed to do when you're, when you're critiquing them, you just tell them that, you know, find out what it is they're trying to say and, and let them know if you get, if you get it or not. Um, uh, but anyway, everything, it's not, I wouldn't say it's autobiographical, but it's all very personal. Mm. If that took, sorry, we should go back to, I'm very tangential as you probably have already noticed. Uh, talking about influences, um, I'm just curious if you are inspired by um, surrealist female artists like Leonora Carrington. Oh yes, incredibly. Yeah. Um, uh, especially like not, not as much for Blood Teen Red Stream because I wasn't as aware of her at that time, but I've definitely, but then inspired, I don't like that. I don't like go towards it and go, I'm going to make this now. This just like hers. But then I see these reson this resonance where it's like the same similar feeling that I get when I look at her work and I feel. Sorry. Oh, what? And I didn't see what more. Uh, something with my phone. Apologies for that. Oh, you're, it, it, it got edited out by the program. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, but I, I definitely feel. Um, Oh gosh, I just have the ter most horrible recall for, for names. Um, you know, Japanese, polka dots. Um, uh, female artist? Uh... <laughs> yes, extremely famous, popular. Um, but I'm just bl completely blanking out on it. Kira but yeah, she works with distinctive patterns in her work yeah, and strange but, sort of amorphous forms. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't but, think of her name either, but I think I know who you're talking about. Yes. So it just, yeah, I, I just have to, have to look it up. But anyway, so she had, had those little striped little things in the mirror room back, I guess it probably happened in the late 70s. But when I, when I saw that imagery back when I was like 19 or 20, I was just like, Oh my God! What is this? This is amazing. Like I don't resonate as much as much with her work now. It you know it, it's amazing, but it just some it doesn't hit me in the same me particularly in the same way. Um, but uh, when I was painting, I, I kind of I, I, the doll thing you know has been following me for a long time. But I had kind of whittled down the doll to the sort of same pod, which is actually it's fairly similar to these. But um, you know I was in college and you know, I, I did probably drink more beer than was healthy for me at the time. Uh, but so I ended up having, this like, you know, but I had this pot, it was much larger and it had this like um, red and white striped, like long tube that then went to this beer bottle that I attached with like this drippy black wax and was very, very dramatic. Um, it's always been a bit dramatic. And uh, so this, this, I don't know, this sort of like it's still kind of the doll body, but it's just sort of whittled down to sort of a, a just a thing. And <laughs> what is the significance of dolls for you? That's the that's the question. Yeah, it's it's, it's challenging to find. I've sort of different answers yeah, depending on what day you ask me. There's sort of different answers, but mm. it, it it kind of epitomizes that feeling of. You know, you're putting on a face for the people in your life that that don't really want to see you necessarily, or you're trying to satisfy the the desires or the needs of someone else, and mm -hmm. and uh, and in a sort of helpless, not present kind of a way. I guess that's kind of one way you might approach it. Um, so the idea of persona and lack of agency. A little bit, and then when you think of like going away from just just sort of a personal personal meaning, it it sort of, you know, female in general, female issues in general of, of, uh, you know, power, powerlessness. Like in my, in my latest art show, I have, you know, it's the same dolls, but they're hung from power poles and it, it, it's there, they're in a way they're like, though I see the five with the power poles all connected is that their power, they, their power, they're generating power. Um, mm -hmm. But if I start going too far into like the the resonances and the meanings, and I start sound like a mad woman, but um, <laughs> uh, most so artists it, do. 
Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. It's, it's, but it's balancing power and powerlessness. I mean, because you think of image is also tremendously powerful um, of what you, your persona and what you project to the world. So it kind of, but it hide, it, it, it can hide or or display and it, it really depends on what, what day you're projecting, I guess. <laughs> uh, along the, sorry, Greg, yep. You wanna... I just wanted to, um, so we don't, so we don't run out of time. Uh, if we can pivot to the new work, um, uh, it's Seed in the Sand, correct? Yes. Um, you had some uh, some things to show us from that, I believe, potentially. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, well, maybe on your on your your blog, you could just like link to the trailer too, maybe. So we don't like we're not not show it here, but like. Basically. Okay. We will have lots, lots okay. of links. Um, links to I know that you have on uh, on YouTube, you've uh, placed several uh, previews uh, of this new work. And um, so I guess a couple of questions um, that are just more uh, administrative are, <laughs> um, how close to being completed do you think you are? Uh, what are you looking for to complete it? And is it connected and how connected to blood tea and red string is it? Okay, well, as far as I know now, uh, there are 54 minutes completed. There's a little less because I'm redoing some things based on some really amazing critique. But, um, and the, the all the commit, Completed footage and all of the storyboards right now are in a they're they're all there. It's like ninety minutes. So so that's and when I do the storyboards, they're they're not exactly timed because it's stop motion and you just can't exactly time them. So so I'm over halfway finished with it. Um, I have, I'm getting to the end of the 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 things that I can comfortably do by myself in my this is my I'm in my living room right now. I've taken over the living room of the house. Um, the the functional living room is actually like a bed one of the bedrooms over there it's like a tv den but uh this is kind of I'm just working on the last few things I can work on so you know, I'm trying to raise like you know 1.5 million to be able to have an actual crew to help me build the some very large sets and also there are live action portions throughout them throughout the movie that need to be created and I would prefer to do them with the right budget and good is small independent film budget but still a budget to have like a crew and not um you know I filmed some things in my garage at the family farm and that it worked out really well but there's grander and larger things that need to be done so there's just like everything left is huge and <laughs> huge I need like assistant animators um you can, there's, you can find a way to do everything in your house, in your living room. So I would inspire others to go ahead and try. But if I don't have to, the film will be much more. Uh, I forget all the will you I'm feature? Saying. Will you feature in those live action se sequences again? I think like you did in Blood Tain. Yeah, I have a, a well, it's not on here. I We've shot a few, a few of the ones that were, or the small, some kind of smaller ones that we're able to shoot in a smaller space. Uh, so I have a mask, but this mask is made from a life cast. This is my actual face. It's a little wider than my actual face because it's there's a life cast, and then it's like that kind of plasticky stuff has been like vacuum cast around the life cast. So it, it's it's actually me. Uh, so yeah, I'll be acting or acting. I mean, it's no voice. This is also a dialogue free, um, a dialogue free film, but I do have voice actors. So. Uh, Susie Gardner of the band L7 is the voice of the of the the antlered ones, and I, I'll show you a little clip of her voice. And Chaton Damon, um, most well known for her time with Christian Death, the kind of goth rock band. If it seems like people either know who Susie is or they know who Chaton is, <laughs> they're they're kind of they're different. They're a different genre of music, but uh, Chaton has done an amazing voice of a sea monster so there's this fairly dangerous sea monster in seed in the sand and she has sung the song for that I actually have a little voice clip of that too and then um my 
my uh, composer slash co-producer slash voice, musician voice artist is does the voices of the the of the of the nest dwellers. I know my names are not really original. It's like nest dwellers, oak dwellers. They're just all you know. They're not very functional. It sounds different when they say it because they have a different language. But she actually was trained to whistle like a bird by her father when she was little. Her name is Carrie Jacobson. Um, I realize I didn't give her name. <laughs> um, so she she actually whistles all of the voices for these six characters and whistles their songs. And uh, I can show you a little clip of that as well if you need to get the taste of their of all the sounds. And uh, there were more questions and I when, when I, I tend to forget the, the the last ones when I've answered the first ones. Uh, that's o that's okay. Um, I'll tell you what, if if you can show us some clips, maybe we'll do it after we finish the discussion. Um, yeah, can, like edit so it and... yeah, so we won't interrupt interrupt this, but um the, the, I guess the, the, the my the second part of my question was uh, what is the relationship between this one and blood tea? Um, when I first started it, I was thinking of it as sort of a trilogy where the but only the trilogy would have been the live action portions. But as I've been working on it, I've been working on it now. I mean, I'm at the first conceived of, of it. If you don't count all the sketches of the characters before I realized they were the characters in the movie and to, I first conceived of it in 2007. And then um, production started in, in full when I raised some money on Kickstarter in 2011. So I have been working on this for quite a while. And as I, I grow as an artist, always, um, I realized this is really not part of a trilogy this is its own film so thanks to the forever nature of of the internet now there are some there are some things that are permanently out there that says there's a trip part of a trilogy but I have changed I have pivoted on that it is not it is in some ways a trilogy in that it is uh, you know the, the next thing that has sprung out of my mind and it is again very personal so you could see it that way and um you know considering that if i if i if i am successful in raising the adequate funding i can be done with it in maybe a year year and a half um if i work as i am now it will probably take me at least nine to nine or ten years to finish it so we but we are you know we are working to to make the right connections to to make this have happen. you Given the long gestation periods of, of your films, have you ever thought about doing a collaboration with Anna Biller, who's the uh, director of The Love Witch? It took her seven years to get her film together. So I was just thinking I perhaps. Uh, I No, I mean, I really enjoy The Love Witch because I have kind of a, a soft spot for, for those sort of that, that era that she is recalling mm. with her work. Um, mm. I, I really love kind of, 70s B movie kind of thing. I guess it kind of spans the 60s to the early 80s, but um, I do I do have a soft spot for that and I do love her, but I, it never occurred to me to collaborate. I I think when I finish Seed in the Sand, you know, maybe I, it would be really fun to collaborate with some people and maybe be directing, just you know, directing like, I want you to do this and have like great meetings and like go forth and create and like be the magician making everything happen um from the like the puppet master with the strings uh but well you know we'll see i have the but i i have 10 i don't tend to collaborate because i i have enough plans for projects of my own that would fill more than one lifetime so so i wouldn't necessarily you, turn down opportunities sorry. Do you prefer the more auteur stamp, you know, like Orson Welles, you want to be writer, director, producer? Do you prefer to have that level of control? And I don't, well, when it's, when it's a passion project, yes. Um, I don't feel that I need to, I would necessarily need to have that on everything. I love working on a team. So I've worked in production for many, many years and there's, there, it's just, you know, it, it depends on the connection to the project, you know, but I'm a team player, <laughs> but if it's mine, it's mine. That that I got to say that idea of a uh, 
uh, Saglaski, uh, um, Biller double team. <laughs> that would be insane. <laughs> All right. It's not bad. It would be in a very interesting collaboration. Very interesting. Well, I don't know. We got to get her people and uh, my people talking. <laughs> let's, let's, let's get seeing this land on first. Uh, yeah. But no, it hadn't occurred, hadn't occurred to me. But now, now I can just see it. Um, anybody uh, else that uh, is an influence, perhaps, that we haven't 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 come up. There's one person I'm thinking of actually uh, that could be an influence simply on some of your visual motifs, um, and that is Tim Burton because I see the black, white, red color scheme, <laughs> and the stripes, and some of the long uh, things. Is it is am I off there or is that uh... well, as much as I enjoy a Tim Burton movie or sometimes more technically a Henry Selleck movie, um, I, I I would not necessarily call them direct influences. Um, when I when I Nightmare Nightmare Before Christmas came out, you know, after my primary plan for Blood Tea was already well underway, um, but I'd say like colleague you know, like inspiration for sure of that, yay, animation, art form, let's get this, get this, get this done. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, Beetlejuice, I, I really identified with um, Lydia. <laughs> I, of course you did. <laughs> how could I not, you know? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, those, it's hard to say, I mean, I, I wouldn't, consider them a direct influence but i can't you know they're they're part they're part of they're part of the stew that 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 has influenced me for sure it's like i was I going to about, ask oh i would say burton i would think more the live action movies uh the, especially the the 80s classic with winona Ryder in them love those are you, what were you going to ask? I was going to ask, has David Lynch been an influence on you? I mean, his paintings sometimes feed into his work. And I think you work in a similar way. Your paintings and your films kind of overlap in some time, some ways. I think he's been definitely a huge inspiration and I, I love his work. I, I'm not sure I could really pick out like, oh, this is an exact influence on the work, but just something about his stamp is on even even his stuff that 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 really kind of managed to puncture into the mainstream that it's he still it's still his stamp and it feels very auteur artist you know it, it feel it feels like he managed to make all these things and retain and stay really true to himself so i'd say that is incredibly inspirational to have you know to 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 stay true to his artistry while also you know becoming well known and being successful and you know having you know his projects produced <laughs> yeah millions of dollars at his disposal yes <laughs> but yeah, yeah he is an amazing individual and I yeah I I do I, I do quite love him so. but that's the thing it's like I. I don't, I don't not always necessarily recognize what has influenced me until later or someone points it out because I don't, as I'm working, like I know I, I've kind of gathered all this just knowledge and experience through my life and it just comes to me as if it's just, I'm almost the puppet of the inspiration. So it's, it, it, so it does tend to take other people to point out sometimes the, the threads that they notice. We have about five minutes. Um, I don't know. Do you want to try to show a clip or do you want to maybe pause and come back and show something? Oh, is it five minutes of the, oh, oh, um, well, the it's up to you. However, we, we could just, uh, uh, we could come back and, and, and just do a little clip reel. <laughs> why don't, why don't we do that? Um, but we'll sort of um, wrap up. Uh, we have a traditional final question that uh, my partner Giles Edwards started asking, and we've asked everyone 
so we'll ask it uh, here too. It sometimes puts people on the spot and they can't think of anything. So if you can't, that's fine. The question is, what is your hometown and can you recommend a restaurant there? Oh, geez. So hometown meaning where I grew up as a child. However you interpret it, where you live now or where you grew up. Oh, geez, neither. I mean, what feels like home? Oh my God, just like I'm gonna have an existential crisis right now. Um, <laughs> I, I, escaped, I escaped my hometown as soon as possible. I graduated high school early to to, to, to start, but um, as an adopted hometown, I feel the most at home in Los Angeles. Though, though, yeah, as my adopted hometown because I moved there fully as an adult. <laughs> um, favorite uh, favorite restaurant. Actually, discovered it um, a, a few years ago, and I've never actually been to the restaurant because I just I ordered it when we were working on the sound with Susie and it's Daisy Mint. Daisy Mint makes amazing. It's kind of pan Asian kind of kind of food. So I'll I'll just I'll just say that because there in in my, where I grew up, Roseburg, Oregon, there is a pretty nice little Japanese place that will make a sushi burrito the size of your head. I think practically. And wow. That is, that is good. So the technical hometown of Roseburg, Oregon is but i can't remember the name of it it's like a sushi place in the in downtown <laughs> well that's cool uh what was the daisy mint did i mm, daisy mint that's what i heard yeah 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 it's just yeah but like i said i've never been to the actual restaurant i've just ordered doordash from it all right so we weren't expecting uh clips but uh i found out that there are some available so what we're going to do is we're going to pause let you set those up and then come back real quick for a real final, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna... yes. Hello, and we're back. Uh, Christiane Sagatsky is going to share some clips uh, from the upcoming Seed and Sand. We have them loaded up. We will uh, upload this separately onto YouTube for people who just want to see this. Um, so we are ready to go. Do you want to set us up with what we're going to look at first? Yes, I want you guys to hear the voices of the creatures. So the first creatures that uh, you should be, uh, it's sharing that, right? You can see? Yes. Okay, so the first creatures, these are a couple of the nest dwellers and the voices are by Carrie wow. Jacobson and my dog decided this is the perfect time to bark. Um, normally a very quiet animal. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hit play and you can hear these little voices. Oops. Oh, no. <laughs> it worked just fine just moments ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. Damn. Pardon my brain. I was okay. Well, I'm going to have to just click that there. So oh good. The dog didn't bark during the during the actual actual show. So the they these are the voices. There are six of these characters and they all have very similar voices, though there there's they're very subtle variations that, that you can hear in them. And then the next slide I would like to share with you is this. Now this is one of the three antlered ones. They are they're not true villains in this uh, in this film, but they definitely do kind of get in the way of the of the the object of the primary objective of the main characters, which are the nest dwellers. So this is the voice of Susie Gardner of band L7 uh, doing her her best monster voice. <laughs> that one, the, the, the light dog. Um, so there are a lot of variations in the uh, 
in the growling, but they're all they're all very monstery voices, and she loves doing the monstery voices, and we love to have her do the monstery voices, and it's a lot of fun. And the 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 final voice actor that I want to share with you. Oops. Now this is the sea monster, and this is voiced by Jeton Damone, um, uh, the uh, best known for being a part of Christian Death. Those uh, she's not on that band anymore, but in the, the in their heyday, she was one of the members. And uh, hopefully, this is the actual video. Oh, here's the actual video. Thank you. Ah, that's a uh, charming, a charming. <laughs> Reminds me very much of Yoko Ono's singing. <laughs> Oh, and and I totally now I totally remember Yayo Yayo Kusama because now you're not asking me the name of the person <laughs> I'm trying to remember. It's just like right there. Yeah. So when if this is part two, when you were watching the before Yayo Kusama Yayo Kusama, and I'm butchering the pronunciation, but just popped in my head. Okay, well anyway, uh, so he works uh, most mostly in sculpture, right? Sculpture yeah, and yeah, and it's all everything has to have polka dots on it, but uh. Okay, that's 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 the way my brain works. Uh, and then I could just sit here and show you things all day if you want to see them. But <laughs> oh. well, the first one, um, the nest dwellers, that was um, um, a human doing the bird whistles, correct? That you told us about. Yes, it's it, she's it, Carrie kind of whistles through her teeth a little bit, but just this. It, it's wonderful to watch her do it because it's not it's not altered it's the way I mean it's it's you know sweetened and all the like lovely things that that sound people do to it but it, it it is as it sounds directly from her from her mouth um so early on uh I I, I had someone who tried to create the sounds with a whistle and or, or I think a recorder, some kind of like a small, small type. They're still called recorders when they're little. And I just, I just wasn't happy because you could hear the breath of the, of the, the person just kind of like breathing in. I was like, this just isn't right. It needs to. And so, Carrie, when we, we were friends. You know, we've been friends for a long time. Um, and uh, she said, well, I, you know, I love Latin red string, and I. If there's anything you need, you know, sound wise, I would love to to help you out with seeing the sand. And I, I you know, I I hear from a lot of people who, who contact me and they're like, "Do you need a musician?" And I'm just like, "Well, um, you know." So with her, I think I loved her band, the Dagons, and um. So I said, but I but like I didn't see how that fit with my movie. But I was like, well, you know what I really need is someone who can whistle like a bird, and oh, this was all this was on email. So so she read the email and and. And I'm I'm told you know, after the fact that she's like, oh my god, uh, because um, nobody know really knows. She never really tells people that her father trained her to whistle like a bird. So it's just like mm, just magically the perfect, the perfect collaborator here for this. <laughs> uh, so anyway. um, yeah, so I guess this is just kind of an observation, but. It sounds like a bunch of musicians from bands uh, volunteered to do. Um, is that is? Do you think it for some reason it just appeals to people who are musically inclined, or is it just a coincidence? Well, um, these the the connection with Susie Susie and Carrie are good friends, and um, and uh, and Jatana and Carrie are also good friends. Carrie has like <laughs> opened a lot of doors and. Um, Jatan's a fan of Blood Tea and Red String, and so when asked if she was interested in, in being the Seed Monster, she was very excited about it. And um, I don't remember if Susie already knew about Blood Tea and Red String at the time, but once introduced to my work, you know, like, oh yes, yes, I want to do, I want to do that. And she also does other. Susie also does other um, voice, uh, some voices for animation. Um, I cannot remember the the main piece that she showed me but some some great stuff that uh, people could look up if, if they wanted to know so so yeah 
that's kind of how, how they came to, into the project is is Car Carrie is the composer also not just the voice she's a composer so she's also gathering you know the sound the sound people I guess that was going to be my next question because I think in the third clip we heard a little bit of music uh incidental music uh on there and I was going to ask who the who does the music for the the movie if it's already scored yeah, uh, Carrie Jacobson is it is in progress to be scored. Um, when I when I received the Guggenheim Fellowship back in two thousand nineteen, um, the funds from that allowed me to to get to pay Carrie to start composing the music. She was already involved in the project, but I was more like, well, we can put you put you on a payment plan. Um, let's figure out like you know, pay, cause I have pay, I have a Patreon and 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 I do have some funds from that, but it's like okay, well. I'll, I could do this much for this many months. And when I got the Google, I was like, okay, I just want to secure your services and let's like make as many of the sound, the, the much of the music as we can. And there's still, so we're about halfway through with the music. Um, we're, we're already through the funds. <laughs> we got through those, but um, so we're about halfway through, through the music. And then I think she, she went through the, the animatic and worked out like how many songs we still need and I forget what it what the number was but it is just it's like both a very exciting and a little daunting um so we are we are just you know working it out and working through it and just gonna I I got a a, a small uh faculty development grant from my from my uh, from Kansas City Art Institute where I teach and and I am to apply towards having Carrie make another song so that is kind of helpful because there's a lot of people that really, you know, you know, they would be happy to work on my movie, except for that they, you know, they need to um, take the paying jobs. And <laughs> but I would, I, 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 I plan to be able to be one of those paying jobs in the near future and bring, gather everyone around me to get this finished. What? So speaking of getting this finished, is it, what can, uh, I know you have a lot of fans who've been pro following the project for a long time. Uh, anybody new, is there anything they can do to help you? Well, um, I still have a Patreon if they, if they wanna, wanna join Patreon and give, give a little bit monthly. I mean, if you imagine that see what is the blood tea and red string instagram i think we're at 100 we're getting close to 172,000 fans on there so i mean can you imagine if like each one of those people gave like two or three dollars but you know people it, it, it's a it's a big pull to get people on patreon so you know i, I don't know but we, it, we we've got it and it it, it is really helpful um if you if you know any producers who are looking for a project to fund you know the you know, like serious not you know sure but um we are we are working towards towards that brian do you have any uh questions uh left i arsenal? did have one question uh just about influences and also um the symbolism in your work i was interested in asking about the artist frida carlo uh, because she also features a lot of um, images of disembowelment, of tearing, of injury to the female form. And that seems to be an aspect of your work that is very prominent. So, um, Yeah, well, I haven't had an injury as dramatic as hers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, so when I first started at San Francisco Art Institute, um, I, I as uh, many female artists do, is paint, paint it myself, and I was talking to my instructor, and I was like, "Well, I'm starting to feel like odd, you know, just painting myself," and I feel inspired to do so, and 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 said, "Well, it," and he kind of told me the history of it, and and that that you know. He, you know that that's that that is a, a thing and he introduced me to Frida Kahlo who you know her most um, most of her artistic output is paintings of herself and you know I read her biography and we had 
the San Francisco Art Institute has a big mural by Diego Rivera in there, it, um, in the, though they covered it up. But of course, the San Francisco Art Institute is defunct now anyway. <laughs> My alma mater is no more. Um, uh, and for those who don't know, Diego Rivera is her husband or was her husband at the time, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a very tumultuous relationship. Uh, so yeah, I read I read that and was really just just loved her work. And um, at the time, it was you know her face wasn't plastered across you know shopping bags and pins and everything. Uh, it was she she was still like known, but but not quite the cultural phenomenon that she is right now. <laughs> so it was it was really refreshing just to learn about her work and and then feel kind of justified in just going and following my inspiration. I mean, if I wanted to paint myself, I'll paint myself. If I, but then my painting myself gradually turned into, I think, I, I remember the, the, the drawing that was a transition. It was kind of a, like a sketchbook drawing, like tearing open my sort of chest belly area and all these crows flying out. And then at that point, I started trying, I kind of transitioned to, to having that female figure be a doll and not the life, lifelike human. Like the first doll was, it was very large, like porcelain kind of head, um, with the crows flying out. And then that just sort of kept going. And I, I, I think I kind of masked myself in it and it also then it taking it away from being directly a picture of me, um, gives me a little more license in, in um, letting it be a little more universal and not so self-referential and to be more free to, to have other things happen to the doll that would feel very different to, for a very realistic human. I mean, you know, compare the, the doll in Blood, Tea and String with the uh, doll in Close. I don't know if you can see me. Yes. Not. Oh, okay. But the doll in quotes in the in the movie May that came out in the early two thousands. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where that doll is like stitched together human remains. So so there's a very different feeling one has looking at the doll in cloth versus the doll in flesh or a a human person being abused. This is well the one of the very first images of the white mice that I painted was them cutting off the breast of a very living female figure that looked similar to me, uh, cutting off the breast with very large shears and stitching up her nether region um, with red string. And, you know, that is a much more in your face, not safe for work image. Whereas if it's just like a doll in white fluffy cotton, I mean, what's the, what's the danger, you know? I mean, it's, it's just fabric. I think it, it definitely has the, it definitely has a different impact. All of the violence is still there, um, but by making it that, I, I, in some ways, it's it's a little more horrifying of an image if it's a doll rather than a person. Um, excellent. Um, <laughs> what what is what is the meaning for you though in terms of um the tearing the disembowelment is that just part of the female experience for you in terms of um well it's there's like the there's like a cutting open there is a freeing of so what generally is escaping is kind of a new life and so it's leaving behind the doll as a husk as a as a shed skin as a like a chrysalis okay sure, sure yeah so then something new comes out of it so well so spoiler alert for blood teen red string just in case anyone you know watching just does not want a spoiler so so when the little the little bird girl you know bursts forth from the doll um new and unexperienced and just like out into the world you know so that is a new birth but like you know, as often happens when you escape the nest wound slash whatever chrysalis, whatever your whatever symbolism you're going to use, you you go out into the world on your own, a little unprepared. Um, the first people who who you know you come in contact with sometimes are very damaging to you, and that you know I feel 
like that 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 spider woman and the the wrapping up of the innocent work like that that is self-referential but it's not like a direct like this happened and the symbolism of that thing that happened it's not it's not that mm. clear cut and obvious but you know it's that kind of snuffing out of the innocence mm. there's um, also a lot of moral ambiguity to your films like you don't necessarily judge what the characters are doing you know the mice or the sorry for lack of a better term the rat birds in yeah. blood tea and red string they just act and you don't necessarily present that as good or bad That's what right. does moral ambiguity well mean to you well i the characters have a life of their own and i'm not privy to everything that that they live i mean to me they feel like they have their own independent existence and I get a glimpse of it. And, um, but also I don't tend to see good and evil, black and white as, as a static, a static state, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, we often see ourselves as the, the protagonist, but you know, in someone else's eyes, are we the protagonist in their story? Maybe we're not. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my characters, they don't tend to really perceive their actions as evil. I mean, I call them evil white mice, but they aren't, you know, specifically, I mean, they paid for the doll, they ordered her. She should belong to them. I mean, it doesn't matter that their money wasn't accepted. It's like she's she's theirs, and they've been they've been slighted, and 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 that 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 they they don't see themselves as the villains here. I mean, we don't know where the blood comes from, but you know we you know if you're if you're not a vegetarian, I mean, you are you gonna can you throw stones? You know, <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, then sure you can be totally judgmental, and if you're a vegan, you are you have license to be extremely judgmental. But like, if you're not, then I mean, my strength lied in these particular. <laughs> So they, they seem a little disturbing, but so, I mean, there's a similar, more similar moral ambiguity in, in, in Seed in the Sand is just, I don't, I don't create ultimate heroes or, you know, ultimate villains. That does not is that an aspect of the pagan imagery in your work as well? I mean, I, I think I've noticed that you, you, you do feature the Wiccan pentagram a lot in your artwork. I mean, does Wiccan culture, pagan culture, feed into your films as well? Well, when I, you know, I moved to San Francisco kind of uh, while that that kind of scene is really still so strong. Um, and, you know, learning about other ways of, of, of understanding the universe in a, in a less apocalyptic way, it was really freeing and healing for me and well I don't necessarily ascribe to specific a specific religion at this point in my life um some of the pagan the pagan remnants well I mean all of them at all well, the pagan talking pagan and that movement it's all like a re religious recreationism as <laughs> in in the way not being not being a continuous thread as as like maybe Hinduism being a continuous uh, potentially a continuous thread for for millennia um but just what when you're talking about the pentagram though you know it, it's definitely i see it in in more uh, representing like physical existence um and life and growth and uh and people may have may have forgotten that the pentagram was also a symbol used in christian mythology and there's some and it, it it's definitely taken on takes on a lot of baggage but i definitely see it as a more positive symbol um and it is you know yet again in in seed in the sand you know the the little nest dwellers they for them and is like the symbol of the of the kind of rebirth in their in their dead dry dry meadow um yeah, but yeah, it's got a lot of interesting symbolism. <laughs> Finally, what what does what does string mean for you? What is what is your obsession with string and red string specifically? 
Um, well, I, I've sewn ever since I was very, very little. So there's that. Um, the string is then also kind of like the string of life, like the fates. The, um, it is when you have been cut open, you know, the string they will sew you back up. It is, it is healing. Um, then, you know, we have the Ariadne string, you know, it also is a path within and a path without. Um, it can take on, it doesn't always really embody all of the things that can symbolize in every single artwork, but um, the strongest part is just it being life, be living. living uh, mm. So tying in with that Greek mythology you mentioned, the fates, the idea of the um, the string of um, destiny, the, uh, yeah. yeah, spinning the thread of life. When I look back at the first kind of like impact of red string before I really, well, I mean, I still had the, the dolls being sewn up really early in my, well, young adult or type early, um, but I saw this movie called The Anchors. Um, it came out probably 19 somewhere around 1990 i don't remember when it came out but it's about this it's about an anchor so that is a a, a woman who is uh bricked up into a, a cathedral and and she can't ever leave and the only thing that had color in that movie it was black and white was a red string and something about the aesthetic of that was really impactful. And I, I haven't watched it for many years, so I don't remember exactly, but it, it did, it, re it represented like life and like renewal and it, and that in, in that context of the someone who's having a, basically all that's left is a spiritual life because she's walled up in, in a, a church, which was apparently a common thing in medieval Europe. I don't know a ton about it. You wall up women in churches. <laughs> Yeah, well, this one, and I, 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 I've forgotten. Like I said, I've forgotten a lot, a lot of the elements of that, of that movie. I should watch it again one of these days because I, I, I know it had an impact. I saw it around, around a similar time period of the Spunkmeyer and movie, and like they just like yeah. those, it's, those things you see in your uh, late teens and early twenties tend to stick, stick really hard, and. Uh, because yeah. that's the time you're starting to be creative yourself. So your influences at that moment apparently last your whole life. So. They do, yeah. Sorry, I'm just like slowly going through my slideshow. <laughs> no, some of them have been surprisingly appropriate. Uh, you, when the doll came up when you were talking about the dolls, the string yeah. came up. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because I'm also, you know, I'm making a movie, but I also have had two art shows recently where I work, I, I made a lot of a lot of um, art for them. So this is a fairly recent piece that I made, the sculptural piece. But it is this, there's a sort of feeling I have noticed in the last maybe five years, or maybe Virgin of 10, is a kind of casting off of the doll. So mm -hmm. I feel like I, you know, I'm not sure what's coming next for me, whether the doll will continue to be so present and I mean, time will tell, but I do it, and it's happening more in my painting and, you know, the kind of work I can finish like more quickly <laughs> film <laughs> is, is the sort of the, the, the re there's a still doll remnants and the sort of a, a sort of a, a light being kind of a, a escaping from, from that. And even in this, uh, even in this picture, it's, it's like bursting out of a, I'm not, I'm, you know, a fabric of some sort. There's cotton, uh, cotton around. So the, I guess the doll is present there. And uh, the, in the next one, the uh, mask, the doll-like porcelain mask is cast off. So. Yeah, it's all the same. It's actually the same piece. It's a sculpt. It's kind of a long sculpture. Um, so, so that that character's on that character's on one end and the mask is has been thrown off by her from another angle it, it has a little more of a watery a watery look because i've got you know sort of star fields this is from mm. seeing the sand the still image 
And so the, the dreams tend to have a star field in the back. Okay. Gorgeous. All right. I'm, you know, this is, uh, this has been uh, so fantastic. Actually, this is a lot more than I expected. But I, I just thought we'd talk. I didn't know we were going to get um, a treat of, uh, of getting to see all this work and talk about it too. Um, but that's fantastic. And so uh, we are almost out of time. Um, we have like three more minutes if you want to say anything else. Uh, but like I say, I've, I've, I'm kind of blown away. I did not expect all this. It's really <laughs> great, great stuff. And I hope uh, Thank you. we're going to increase your awareness and get you some new Patreon subscribers because yeah. you really deserve to get this done. Anything, any I final thoughts? Better. Yeah, I speak better in images, so that's where the image is. <laughs> Once I get the images going, I'm like, uh, well, I I have, you can find Blood Tea and Red String on Instagram. There's a Blood Tea and Red String Instagram account that you can go check out. And there is a Seed in the Sand Instagram you can check out. Um, Blood Tea and Red String dot com, Seed in the Sand dot com. It will take you to all of the, all of the things that you can access um so then beside behind the scenes things on the seed in the sand we're, we're giving blood teen red strings instagram a little more love right now than seed in the sand because we're, like, we're like we can't give away too much of the movies so i'm like i've been build, building that up there are well this will soon be the past but right now there are screenings of blood teen red string at alamo draft house new york san francisco and los angeles um on November 7th through 9th, depending on which place you are living. There are still a few seats left. They are selling out fairly quickly. We, we had one screening in each location, but all those sold out. So now we have more, which was very exciting to see. For a 17 year old movie, that is um, really fun. <laughs> Excellent. So having a revival right now. We will link all of that stuff uh, in various places, both on the blog and on the YouTube, uh, where you may be watching this. Uh, so check below if you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Brian. Any final words in the last two minutes? Uh, no, um, just thank you, Christian, for sharing all of that, particularly about the um, the, sim the symbology and, yeah, uh, the deeper meaning behind your work, which is always fascinating to me, just, you know, uh, seeing the artist's psyche on screen. So. <laughs> well, thanks for drawing it out. It's been really fun talking to you guys. And thank you for inviting me to your show. Oh, thanks. It. Hopefully we can have you back maybe after Seed in the Sand is ready. Um, thanks, everybody. We got to go. We got to leave. That was, uh, that was fantastic. I had a great time. Thanks, Christiane. Thanks, Brian. And see you next week. <laughs>